right? We're talking about problem solving today. No new, or at least for the first part. So in order to get this free change of direction for the tension, we need two things. We need our pulleys to um, be frictionless. We need frictionless pulleys and ropes. So there's no like uh, rubbing that like, causes heat or whatever. And we also need our rope and pulley system to be massless. So let me just give a, or draw a quick example where pulleys might show up. So ceiling. And then we have this system. So we have one pulley. By the way, pulleys will often be drawn as just circles in these diagrams that's suspended from the roof. Then we have another pulley that's just attached, that's just hanging. And so attached to this pulley here is a mass of say mass M1. Attached to this block is a mass of say M2. So here there's two pulleys and they are uh, both redirecting the force. The, the rope is supposed to be around the pulley, but kind of hard to draw. So this is just an example problem that we could analyze. So for example, if neither block falls, how must the masses compare? Like, do they have to be the same weight? Does one have to be heavier than the other? And so we can actually analyze this using force diagrams. So let's draw some free body diagrams for the mass or for the, uh, for the, for two of the masses and one of the pulleys. So, I'm actually just going to draw the free body diagram of a pulley and a mass. So here's the pulley on the left. It has a force pulling down on it with mass M or with, with magnitude M1G. Actually, I told you not to do that, so I won't do that. I'll, I'll write this FG1. So keep in mind, by the way, that this is technically a tension force that's pulling down, but it has the magnitude of the of the gravitational force on it has the same magnitude as the as the gravitational force acting on m1 so m1 is has gravity pulling down and tension pulling it up so the pulley has tension pulling it down with that same magnitude so this is just a shortcut and then also there's two forces on the sides of the pulley there's a tension force pulling it up and a tension force pulling it up now these are the same tension force because they're from the same rope right so you have the rope wrapping around this and because it's frictionless, you can think of it like almost like gears, like a gear in a chain. Um, how do I want to phrase this? It's, it's actually, it's think of it as like being grippy, right? So the rope is going to pull it up on both sides with the same tension force. And the reason we know that is just because it's connected twice to the same pulley. And the, and the tension forces from each rope are, connect, are applied to the pulley, and so or each side of the rope are applied to the pulley. And then on the second mass, we have, this is the free body diagram for the second mass. We have Fg2, and then we have a tension force up. Now, importantly, the tension force up on that mass is the same, it, or is, is from the same rope as the tension force that is causing these two forces, the, ten, the tension force pulling up on the pulley, on the, on the leftmost pulley. So all of these tension forces are the same. That's why I use the same letter to represent them. Otherwise I would have called it T1, T2, T3, whatever. So now if we assume that neither block, neither, neither block falls, that means that in particular, the pulley, the, the leftmost pulley also doesn't move because it's not attached to the ceiling. It's just attached to the, um, it's just attached to the block. So that, so the fact that neither block moves, that would imply that a one is zero, or actually let me write that over here. That would imply that A one is zero and A two is zero. So if neither block moves, the acceleration is zero. So what does that mean? Well, if A two, or if let's say A one is zero, that implies that F net on one is zero. And by the way, we're using this pulley as a proxy for the mass because all of the, all of the, uh, if if the if the top block moves, how do I want to phrase this? Um, 
yeah, we're, we're just using it as a proxy. I, I can actually be a little bit more specific here. Um, just just to, because you guys are not familiar with this. So there's so let's in, instead of using the pulley as a proxy, let's just do do this properly. So the pulley will experience two tension forces up and one tension force down. The two tension forces that are up are the same, but the tension force that's pulling it down is from a different rope, so it has a different magnitude. And then the tension force up on the uh, block on M1 has magnet has the same magnitude as the tension force pulling down on the pulley, and then this has magnitude F G G1. So we want <clears throat> um, we we want the acceleration for all of these to be zero, right? Which is a reasonable thing to do a reasonable thing to want if you don't want them to move. So first and foremost, if the acceleration is zero, that means the net force should be zero. So we have 2t, and I'm going to use the upward, I'm going to use the standard coordinate system. We have 2t minus p2 equals zero. We get t minus m2g equals zero. These are just the, the, uh, the net force equals zero in the y direction for each of these. And then we have t2 minus m1g equals zero. So now we can just, we have three equations, three variables. Um, <clears throat> or rather, we technically we have three equations and four variables, but we're trying to find the mass of one in terms of the other. So that's, that's another variable. So we can do some rearranging. So t2 is equal to two times p. Take that, plug it in here. We get that um, m1g is equal to two times capital T. From this equation, we get that uh, m2g is equal to p. So what do we find from uh, solving for t? We get that m we get that m1g is equal to two times m2g. Plugging this in here, or canceling off appropriately, we get that m1 should be equal to two m2. So what we learn from this is that in order for both blocks to not move. The first mass has to weigh twice as much or have twice as much mass. And that's maybe that seems weird, but if you think about it for just a second, there's twice as much tension force pulling block uh, block M1 up as there is pulling block M2 up. And those tension forces have to balance each balance against each other. So uh, there's twice as much tension, there's twice as much lifting force on M1. So it could be twice as heavy in order to counteract the moat, in order to counteract the downward force from M2. That's that's the way to think about this. <clears throat> this one that's just the uh, that's just the free body diagram for this block here so it has a tension force pointing upwards because the rope that it's attached to is pulling it up and then it has a gravitational force pointing downward all right so there's another type of thing that that will pop up in uh these types of problems and that's called constraints so so pulleys will show up a lot and so the idea is you just trace you you figure out how many places does the tension force come in contact with various pulleys um that might that that may or may not affect the uh the oh and by by the way the shorthand that i was going to use that i decided not to is that is that if we had instead just imagined that this pulley has mass M1, it would have been an identical problem, right? <clears throat> so by attaching just a rope that's just attached to the pulley, all it does is it transfers the weight of M1 to the pulley. So we could have just solved it with just these two diagrams. And instead of having T2 downwards, we would just have the mass uh, or the, the gravitational force downwards there. But, but hopefully you can see why those two set, uh, situations would be the same. All right, let's talk about constraints. So constraints are another type of thing that show up in these type of force type problems because they are the, these these constraints answer questions like what happens to one thing if enough if if there is some external factor that will affect it. So uh, I can formalize this that that sentiment by describing a constraint in words. So constraints are one or more relationships. These are mathematical relationships, by the way. One or more relationships between quantities that describe the system under study. Now, the uh, the important point to note here: the system under. Um, so, when I say relationships. 
what this f equals ma is not a constraint. So what these constraints really are is they are external relationships. They are, they are things that come not from Newton's laws, like they don't come from Newton's third law, they don't come from Newton's second law, and they don't come from just formulas for equations for forces like uh, that that the gravitational forces mg. These are external things. So, uh, for example, a constraint might be that the maximum value of the static frictional force is mu sub s times n. So, what a, a constraint in a problem might be something like assume or or suppose that the that the the static frictional force is maxed out. That's an external constraint that would tell us that actually f sub s is equal to mu sub s times n, rather than just being less than or equal to. So that, that tells us extra information that doesn't come from Newton's laws or from descriptions of the forces and so on. It's, it's like extra, it's like external information from the physics. So another good example of this type of, uh, or where, where a question um, has a constraint would be if M2 drops, and we're looking back at the previous example. So let me just grab this really quick. So if M2, if the mass drops 10 centimeters, how far up does mass one go? God, I can't write today. So this is a constraint because th this question can't be answered just with Newton's laws. Um, one way to see this is that the rope, so, so, so you kind of have to think about this, this question. You have to think about the problem. You can't just derive it from some equation. Think about it this way. If, if mass two goes down one centimeter, that means that the uh, total length of the of the rope below the pole. Oh, oh boy. That means that the total length of the rope below the second pulley increases by one centimeter, right? Which means that, and because the rope doesn't stretch, that would mean that the uh, remaining rope has to shrink by one centimeter, or, or it's, it's one centimeter less long. So where could that extra length come from? Well, it can't, it can't come from wrapping around this pulley less. That's because the pulley has a certain circumference and that rope has to wrap around it. What it can come from it is it can come from this pulley going up. So if that pulley goes up some amount, then the rope that is needed to wrap around it gets shorter. And one way to see this, or, and, and so you could probably intuit that if, if M2 goes down by 10 centimeters, M1 should go up by five centimeters. And the reason for that is because if this one shrinks by five centimeters, and this distance uh, also shrinks by five centimeters, then that whole portion of the rope will shrink by 10 centimeters, which gives 10 centimeters of extra rope for M2. And so the answer here is five centimeters. And so actually we learned something more. This tells us that not only does the distance traveled, is there a two to one relationship between distance traveled? There's also a two to one relationship between velocity, right? If M1 goes up five centimeters in one second, M2 will go down 10 centimeters in one second. So that implies, so, so we could say that delta x1 is equal to uh, one half, uh, I'm gonna put magnitudes here, uh, delta x2. And that implies that v1, the magnet, again, magnitude, is equal to 1 half v2. And, if, and so we could continue this argument, just take another time derivative. That would imply that a1 is equal to 1 half of the magnitude of a2, and so on. And so, and we can also say something about the direction. If m1 goes up in the y direction, then m2 goes down. So in fact, we can actually say that a1 in the y direction is equal to negative one half a2 in the y direction. And this, just from reasoning, we didn't use Newton's laws anywhere, this sort of equation, a relationship between the accelerations of two, two otherwise separate bodies is a constraint on the motion. So now if, you, if the question was, assume the mass of m1 is blah, 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 
uh, and the mass of M2 is blah, blah, blah. Well, you could use this relationship to find the acceleration of one of the masses, or if you can find the acceleration of one of the masses in terms of the other, then you can use this relationship to explicitly solve for the uh, accelerations because they have to be, they have to satisfy this relationship. So this is a constraint on the motion. And these sorts of things will pop up pretty frequently too. Um, another type of uh, problem that will show up frequently is problems involving inclined planes. So let's say I have an inclined plane, looks like, uh, that's too big. Inclined plane that looks like this. Usually you'll be given some sort of angle somewhere. Maybe you'll be given this angle. Um, and let's say you have a block on it, a block with mass capital M. And maybe this uh, this inclined plane has a coefficient of static friction u sub s. Maybe it's like the inclined plane is rough, right? And maybe there's a pulley here. So this mass, which is tied to a rope, is attached to a pulley. And then from that pulley is hanging another mass with mass little m. So you might ask the question. This is just a, a standard type of physics problem setup. So the question might be, if neither block moves, what is the minimum value? Minimum value of capital M. Now, first, let's think about this for a minute, right? If M was very, very big compared to little m, like if, if big M was 1,000 kilograms and little m was 1 kilogram, you'd expect big M to slide down, right? If, on the other hand, little m is was significantly larger than big M, you would expect big M to slide up the ramp. There will, now, if there was no friction, there would be exactly one value where they would be balanced, right? Because there's nothing to stop it from moving if they're just a little off balance. However, static friction counters the, or counters attempted motion. So you can imagine that, um, that if the, uh, let's say that, Let's say that we can we have a knob that adjusts the mass of capital M. So it starts off so that they're perfectly balanced. Uh, so that even if there was no friction, um, they would just stay perfectly balanced. Now let's say we start turning down the mass of capital M. We make capital M smaller and smaller in mass. Um, so eventually you turn it down enough, the big M will slide up, right? But there will be a place because of the friction, the friction is opposing that motion. There will be a minimum value of capital M where it'll still be stationary and the, fr the, the frictional force will precisely cancel out whatever force would otherwise try to cause it to move. And the reason that happens is because the friction, the static frictional force has a maximum value. If you go over that, then, then it just, static friction just loses. So it makes sense that there would be a maximum value for or sorry, a minimum value for M. Similarly, there would also be a maximum value for M, by the way. But the important point is that we know from that and from that thought process that the frictional force is going to point to the left. And it has to point to the left because the other force that's going to cause M to move if M was too small would be uh, pulling it to the right because it would start to slide up the, up the ramp. So let's do some analysis of this problem. And we're going to go over this problem in pretty, pretty happy detail. So let's start with force diagrams. So first, I'm going to draw a force diagram for M. Now, I'm going to do a lot of things in here that might be different than what you would otherwise do. So first of all, um, I'm going to use a rotated coordinate system. I'm going to use a coordinate, a coordinate system that is aligned with, the, um, aligned with the inclined plane. You can do that. You can choose a different coordinate system for different free body diagrams that's always allowed. And I'm doing that because it'll make the math easier. So for capital M, the free body diagram will look, there'll be a normal force pointing up. There will be a friction, a static frictional force pointing down the ramp and to the left. There will be a tension force pulling it up the ramp and to the right. And then there'll be a gravitational force that's actually straight down, not, not straight down the ramp. But importantly, this, uh, this force we can always break down forces into components. And so this angle relative to the y-axis is theta degrees. And you can work out the trick for that if you really wanted to. So what are the components of acceleration here? Well, 
Well, that is sufficiently large when it slide down and since friction acts in the opposite direction, it will point to the right. Yes, but we're asking for what is the minimum value of M? So we're probing what happens when M gets small. The direction of the frictional force will vary depending on whether M is greater than or less than the optimal mass. So the components of acceleration, we need to look in the X and Y direction. So in the X direction, it's the, the net force in the X direction divided by capital M and the net for, and the acceleration in the Y direction. And by the way, remember that the Y direction means this direction here. The net or is the net force in the Y direction. Again, Y means upwards or, or, or perpendicular to the plane. And so now we can use our free body diagram to add up the components of the, uh, or to find the net force in the X and the Y direction. So the net force in the X direction, well, we have one force that points in the X direction. So that's T, the tension force. We have we subtract off of force, the tension force that points in the negative X direction. And then we have a component of the gravitational force that points in the negative X direction. We have to break down the, the force into its component because it doesn't point along one of our axes. And so you can do that, you can do the trig. You would find out that this is the gravitational force of M. It has my, the, the X component of the gravitational force. Has, uh, is equal to the gravitational force of M times the sine of the angle of that triangle. The net force in the Y direction is just the normal force because that points upwards in our coordinate system. And then we subtract off the component of the gravitational force that points downwards. F, G sub, F sub G M cosine of theta. And now we want those to we want those to both be zero because we are trying to figure out what is the minimum value of m where neither block moves. If neither block moves, that means the acceleration is zero. So that so what does that imply? It implies that the tension force minus the frictional force minus f sub g m sine theta equals zero, and n minus f sub g m cosine theta equals zero. So these are two of our equations that we're going to be working with. Now, there's another object. So we have to draw the free body diagram for that. So this has a slightly simpler free body diagram. We're going to use the standard coordinate system here. Again, it's a separate free body diagram, so we can use a different choice of coordinate system. It doesn't matter which coordinate system you use per free body diagram. So this is, has a mass little m. It has a tension force up. And remember, that tension force is the same since it's connected to the same rope, right? And it has the gravitational force down. And again, we want this block to not move. Not moving means that its acceleration should be 0, assuming it starts at rest. So we want AX is 0 and AY is 0. So a, there, AX is just 0. There are no forces in the x direction for this block. However, the forces in the y direction for this block, this is f net divided by y, or uh, f net y divided by m. And we can calculate that using our free body diagram. That is just t minus f g little m. And so we get a third equation that t minus f sub g little m equals 0. OK, so we have three equations. Great. However, you might note that there are uh, <clears throat> there are seemingly four variables. Um, there is f sub g m, or actually there's a lot more than four variables, but we haven't implemented everything yet. Um, oh, I'm going to call this, no, that's, that's actually fine. OK, so three equations, and we have, we have more to do. There's also a constraint. Like I mentioned, static frictional force gives us a constraint that f sub s is less than or equal to mu sub s times n. Now, this n here is the n of the big block because the little block doesn't have an n. That's just how that, it, that, that that's what tells us. How do we know that the tension falling on m is the same? Because they're attached because the tension force is the same throughout a rope and they are attached to the same rope. That's just a fact about ropes. Rope, ropes have equal tension throughout. Um, so this is a constraint. It tells us about what the maximum possible value is for, or the maximum possible magnitude is for our our static frictional force. So we can actually take that and plug it in to uh, this top equation here. So what we get, 
So you can add fs to both sides of that top equation. And then you can substitute that, or and then you can say that f sub s is less than u sub s times n. So what we get is this leads us to the equation t minus f sub g m sine theta is less than or equal to mu sub s times n. Let me make that a little bit shorter. So all I did was I just added f sub s to both sides from this top equation up here. And then I, well, I knew that f sub s was less than something else. So that means that the stuff f sub s was equal to, f sub s, remember, that's the magnitude of the frictional force. Magnitude of the static frictional force. And the direction is down the ramp because that is the direction it has to act in order to oppose being pulled up the ramp. Right, so all I did was I added f sub s to the other side. So then I had t minus f sub gm sine theta equals f sub s. But f sub s is less than mu sub s times n. So that means that t minus f sub gm, or t minus f sub gm sine theta is less than mu, mu sub s times n. So this is what I mean by implementing constraints. This constraint didn't come from Newton's laws. It just came from a fact about how friction works. Um, OK, so now, now we can do a little bit of simplification. A note here that f sub gm is capital Mg, and f sub g little m is little mg. So what do our equations look like? I'm just going to summarize our equations. So we get what our top equation, t minus f or t minus capital Mg sine theta is less than or equal to mu sub s times n. All right, we have a second equation, n minus Mg cosine theta is equal to 0, and t minus little Mg is equal to 0. So these are our three equations that we have to work with now. And now you'll see that, in fact, there's only really, um, <clears throat> there's only really like Four, there, there are four variables. There's the tension, the normal force. And by the way, we're assuming that theta is given to us. It's just a, it's just a constant that we're given. Uh, there's the tension. There's the normal force. There is the um, there's the mass. There's the big mass and the little mass. It's four variables. And so you might say, oh well, how are we going to find how big how, or what the minimum size of capital M is? Well, of course it'll be in terms of little m. So we're actually just trying to eliminate two more variables so we can get capital M is, is greater than or equal to some value times little m. You'll see what I mean in a, in a moment. So from these equations, we can derive a few facts that the tension is equal to mg, uh, that the normal force is equal to m big mg cosine theta. And so we can take those and plug them in. We get that little mg, because that's what tension is equal to, minus capital mg sine theta is less than or equal to mu sub s times capital Mg cosine of theta. And so let's cancel out the g's because they cancel out. Um, and so, and then we're going to add this, add this term to both sides. And we're left with M is less than or equal to, and I'm going to factor some, mu sub s times capital M cosine theta. Sorry, uh, mu sub s cosine theta plus sine of theta, all times capital M. And so that tells us that the big mass, capital M, has to be greater than or equal to little m divided by mu sub s cosine of theta plus sine of theta. And so that tells us what the minimum value of capital M is. If capital M was equal to lowercase m divided by mu sub s cosine theta plus sine theta, that would be the minimum possible value, at which point the friction would be would precise the frictional force would precisely match out, match the uh, the tension force on the big block, um, at its maximum value at the friction force's maximum value. It they just it's just a number it's just it's just the angle of the ramp. How did I cancel g? Because it was in all of it was in all of them. So we're just factoring it out and then canceling. So this is like the type of equate the type of problem. It's just the mass of two different blocks. 
the, the mass of the small block is little m, the mass of the big block is big m. They're just two different masses. So I'm going to proceed because we still have a lot to go through, unfortunately. So another thing that we can I interpret the relationship for if theta increases, de decreases? Yeah, sure you can. You could say that. So, so if theta was, for example, zero, um, sine of theta is zero, cosine of theta is, or cosine of zero is one. So this would say that, so, so if the ramp, if it wasn't a ramp, if it, if it was just level, then the minimum value of, um, yeah, yeah, we can talk about it afterwards. But, but just think about what happens when theta is, when theta changes. So it's not that, that I just knew the constraint. It's that I knew what type of things were in the problem. I knew friction was involved in the problem. And so I know a fact about friction. So I just use that fact. And that fact is a constraint. It just happens to be a constraint. It's not like there had to be a constraint with problems, so I had to go find it. It's just like there didn't have to be a constraint. It just happened to be that there was one because the question was asking about a minimum. Typically, if a question is asking about a minimum value or a maximum value or some sort of relationship between one thing's motion and another thing's motion, that usually implies that there's a constraint, but not always. Anyway, I'm going to proceed. So another thing that we need to talk about. So far, all we've talked about is what happens if, um, no, the, the, the coefficient is just a number. You can treat it as a variable, or you can treat it as a constant, or it could just be given. Um, up till now, we've talked about uh, what happens when things are like, like analyzing things, analyzing systems when nothing's moving, i.e., what's the minimum value for both, for both blocks to not move? What, um, if neither block falls, how do the masses compare, and so on? What we haven't talked about is what happens when there's motion in our system. So we need to talk about incorporating motion. Um, so the question is, is really, what if, what if one of the accelerations is not zero? So uh, sometimes, for example, you might want to find the acceleration of the block, or you might be given an acceleration, and you need to use that to find more information. There's one example that's in the lecture notes that I'm not going to spend time on because it's not, I actually don't really like this example, but I am going to spend time on another example that uses this method. So let's talk about a rock. So a rock is swung on a string. Swung on a string in a vertical plane. Uh, it's like swung on a string in a circle in a vertical plane. Um, but it only barely makes it to the top. So you guys have all done this. You've like swung a yo-yo or something. And like, if you, if you don't swing it fast enough, it'll just like barely make it to the top and then continue around. And the, and the way you know that is that if it, if it was going just slightly slower, it would fall, right? So that, that's going to be our hint here. Uh, the important point is that we need that the string remains at the full length. So the, the string never loses tension. And actually, that's not a good way to phrase it. Uh, it never, it never, it never falls. It never compresses. So the string remains at full length. So the question is: find the speed of the rock. Speed of the rock in terms of the length of the string. Now you might say, well, how do we do that? Well, you have the tools. Overheating. Um, okay, I think I think we're good. So I'll just like leave it more open to the air or something. So um, I'm gonna draw a picture. So here's a person. They're holding onto a string, and that string is going around in a circle with like a rock tied to it. Now don't do this because you'll hurt someone. But like swing it around and around and around like a yo-yo. So first, let's let's just draw a free body diagram for the for the rock. Now the question is, where do we draw a free body diagram? Like at what point in its motion? Because its motion is changing, right? The trick here is that we only know information about the rock at the very top of the. So what we can do is we will draw a free body diagram at the top of the circle. So here, here's our rock. So at the top of the circle, because there's because the uh, it only barely makes it to the top, the tension on the string 
is zero. The, the tension on the string isn't, it's not pulling it anymore. It's just gravity doing work. And so uh, let's choose a coordinate system. So let's have this be plus y downwards. So the only force acting on it is mg, or is the graph circle or rock in a circle. At the bottom, you can actually feel like the tension, the, the, the pull of the string. Like it actually pulls on you as it's going around quickly. But if it just barely makes it to the top, it's not pulling on you anymore. If you don't feel a tension, then the rock doesn't feel a tension either. And so that's how we would know that there's no tension. So there's no other forces here. The only thing touching the rock, um, the only thing touching the rock is the string that can only give a tension force. The only other source of force could be the Earth from gravity. So that means that the force in the y direction, the net force in the y direction, is just the acceleration in the y direction. But this net force in the y direction, it's just mg. Now, here's where the trick comes from. And this is where we incorporate more information from previous, uh, previous days. The acceleration, we, we know the doubt. We, so if the rock is at the top of its arc, we know the acceleration that points towards the center. In fact, that's centripetal acceleration, the acceleration that an object has to undergo in order to go, go in a circle is acceleration that points towards the center, which makes it centripetal. So we know the value of this. Because, because it's at the top of the it's at the top of its loop, the centripetal acceleration points straight down. And the only forces we have are forces that point straight down. So the acceleration in the y direction at the top of the circle really is just v squared over r. I don't know what just happened. Um, and so that really is just a y centripetal. Another reason why we wanted to analyze it at the top of the circle was because gravity doesn't necessarily point in the direction of centripetal acceleration anywhere except at the top of the circle, right? And so in fact, it would have to be dealt with by uh, having a tension force that helps as well. So in this case, we, we therefore have that mg is mv squared over r. And so we can do some algebra and we find that the velocity of the rock, or sorry, the speed of the rock is square root g times r, where r is the length of the string. So here we had to use facts about the acceleration that we knew. In this case, circular motion implies that there's some sort of centripetal acceleration. Um, we had to use that fact to relate velocity to the, um, we had to relate the velocity to the acceleration because we were, we were asked the question about the speed of the rock. And Newton's second law doesn't involve the speed of the rock. This is, this is just, uh, this is really, this is another constraint. The, the centripetal acceleration doesn't have anything to do with Newton's laws. It just is the acceleration necessary to go in a circle. And so we used that fact to solve this problem. Um, and by the way, the trick here is, is converting words uh, to facts about the system. So the, the first point is that it only barely makes it to the top. That means, or that should set off in your mind, it should set off the, the notion of, oh, that means that there's no tension up there automatically. That should get you there. And then once, you, once you've realized that there's no tension at the top of the arc, that should make your life a lot simpler because if you say, oh, well, if there's no tension up there, the free body diagram is a lot easier. So why don't I draw the free body diagram at the top of the arc, which you then do. And then you say, OK, well, that means that g is equal to a. But what's a? Well, what else do we know? Well, we know it's moving in a circle. Swung. We know it's, it's, it's being swung in a circle. So what do we know about, about circular motion? Bingo, centripetal acceleration. The acceleration that points towards the center of the circle is v squared over r, has, has that magnitude. Oh, but wait, the acceleration that this object experiences, the force that it experiences, points towards the center of the circle. So we can set them equal. That's the thought process that, that you need to develop. And it'll take time, but you'll get there. All right, so we only have nine minutes left. I do want, I, I do have more stuff to do. So we might run a few minutes over. I'll just stop at a good stopping point. But we need to start on, start on another, uh, we need to start on another se slightly separate topic. So we're going to talk about work and energy. So far, we've only talked about forces, accelerations, kinematics, and so on. Work and energy is kind of a separate realm. Like, it's very closely related, but it, it's a separate way of thinking about things. So first, let me define what work is. Or let, let me talk about work, rather. So for, for a lot of problems, we only care about speed, not velocity. 
Um, now, the example here is the problem we just worked out. Like, I didn't, the question wasn't what's the velocity of the rock? The question was just what's the speed? So we don't need information about its direction. Um, and so what we would like to do is we'd like to figure out a way to solve these types of problems without having to complicate them that uh, by talking about vectors, because vectors include magnitudes and directions, and we'd rather not deal with vectors. We'd rather just deal with numbers because it'll make our, our uh, problem solving techniques simpler. So in order to do that, we need an alternative method, alternative method from Newton's laws, or from Newton's second law anyway. So Newton's second law is an equation about vectors, but we need something that differs slightly. And it should be equivalent to, but not identical to Newton's second laws. So we're going to consider, to get, to get, the, the, to get this method, we're going to consider um, <clears throat> the components of acceleration first. So it might seem like I'm, I'm kind of starting from somewhere else completely, but I promise this will leave where we want. Components of acceleration. So remember, acceleration is the time derivative of velocity, just a true statement, which is the time derivative of the magnitude of the velocity, the speed, times the direction of the velocity, v hat. And so this is that whole business of perpendicular and parallel components. So we have dv dt times v hat plus v times dv hat dt. So this is a perp, or sorry, a parallel, and this is a perp. So this is the parallel and perpendicular component of acceleration. Now, one thing to note is that the, if you dotted the acceleration vector into the velocity direction vector, so this is how much of the acceleration vector points in the direction of the velocity, this is equal to dv dt v hat dot v hat plus v times d hat dv hat dt dot v. Now, or dot v hat. Now, if you remember from before, this vector, we did this like a, like last week, that dot product is zero. And it's zero because it's effectively the derivative of a thing that is that is one. It, so remember that we basically rewrote that dot product as the sum of two different dot products, applied the product rule in reverse, and we found that this is the derivative of the number one, which is zero. Now, the dot product of a vector with itself is just its magnitude squared. And these have magnitude one. So this is just the number one. So the dot product of the acceleration vector A with the velocity vector, sorry, the velocity direction vector, the velocity unit vector V hat is just the rate of change of the speed. So that's an important fact. Uh, that is that A, so, so from, from that fact, we can derive this, the statement that A dot V, not V hat, is just the velocity of v, or the velocity of v, times the derivative of v with respect to p. And that's just because um, v hat is just v times v, or sorry, the vector v. This is because v equals v times v hat. So all I did was I just multiplied this equation through by the magnitude of v. Uh, did I freeze? Can, can everybody see me, hear me? Uh, well, my camera looks like it's going. My internet looks like it's fine. I will continue because it's being recorded anyway. So, if we're interested in changes in speed, then it's enough to consider a dot v. This will this will tell us about how speed changes because we can relate the change in speed dv dt to um, this dot product divided by the magnitude of v. So we're going to talk now. So we're going to we're going to use this factor later or this fact later. But first, we're going to talk about kinetic energy and the work energy theorem. Well, we're going to use this factor like in a minute or this fact in a minute actually. So this is where we get to the big guns. So can you guys still hear me? Yeah. Give me a give me a yes in chat if you can hear me and see me. And see me writing. Oh boy. What is happening? 
All right, so I'm just going to continue because I have to continue. It's being recorded. All right, so just as a note, so so just as a note here, the velocity vector is dl dt. Now l, so so before we had the velocity vector is dr dt. It's the derivative of displacement. Here, l the l vector is like the r vector. It's like displacement, um, except it's along a specific path. A specific path. Sorry that this is being so finicky lately. So the way to think about this is L is the vector from like if you if you have a path, then L is the vector from here to uh, from your start to your point along the path. So these would be L's at different times, and so the way that L changes is what would give you the speed, right? Because that would just be the vector along the, that, oops, that would point in the direction along the path. So now from before, just a minute ago, v dv dt is equal to a dot v, right? Right, right up there. And so we can replace V with the LDT. So V dV dt equals A dot dL dt. Now dL dt is a vector, right? Because L is a vector. You take the time derivative of a vector, you get a vector back. And now I'm going to do something that my advisor would probably tell me I shouldn't do because he's a mathematician. But you know, this is a physics class. We're allowed to do this kind of thing. I'm going to cancel off DTs. Sue me. So that gives us that v dv equals a dot dl. And so now you have to think of these d's, like dv and dl, as just small changes in those quantities. Now I'm going to multiply through, multiply through by m, by the mass of whatever's traveling. So we have mv dv equals ma dot dl. And this MA, that is the net force, right? From Newton's second law, that is the net force on the object. So what we have is we have MV dV equals F net dot DL. So you take the force on the object at a given instant in time, you got it into the small, ch into the small change of DL. So that would just be a small amount of, it, it would be this, this, oh, shoot. It would be the vector that goes between two 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 other L vectors. So it would point between it it, it would uh it's a, sorry it's a terrible diagram because it keeps getting erased. Um, it would be the vector that points in the direction. So that might be at DL or that might be DL, but it's really really small, right? So then all we're gonna do, and I I know we're done. Uh, I'll be done in a minute. Um. Let me rename this A and B. So uh, you go from A to B. Then we just integrate from A to B. So we're integrating from time A or from, from place A to place B. Now this might seem weird. So what this looks like is it looks like an integral from A to B. M V D V equals the integral from A to B of F net dot DL. And so what this tells us, we can, we can, this is an integral we can do now, right? It's just a variable V. We're, we're integrating it with respect, to, with respect to V. So this is just one half M V A squared. So this is the velocity, sorry. This is the speed at position B minus one half M V A squared, the speed at position A. And that's equal to the integral from A to B of F net dot DL. So this equation, super useful. This is this this equation is the work energy theorem. It is a, so this this right hand or this left hand side is the change in kinetic energy. I'm almost done. I promise. Uh, I just have a little bit more to do. This right hand side is the work done. This is this is how we're defining it. Work done by the net force. 
So what we can learn from these things is that there's this quantity. This is a change in a something. It's the difference between two things at two different places. So there is a quantity called kinetic energy. And that quantity is one half mv squared with mass having units of kilograms, v having units of, or v squared having units of meters squared per second squared. So multiplying those together gives us kilograms, meters squared per second squared, which we define to be a joule. Has, it has its own unit name. It's called a joule. It's abbreviated by J. Um, by the way, from this integral, this tells us that only the force parallel to the path taken contributes. So think back to when we were talking about dot products at the very beginning of the course. We had a person pushing at an angle that was not in the direction or at an angle relative to the direction of motion. That's what we mean. So you only consider the part of the force that is in the direction of motion. So just in words, and I'm going to write this out and then we'll be done. The work energy theorem is, is the following statement. The total work done by all the forces, by all the forces, and I got to write this out exactly, uh, acting on an object from a starting point to an ending point. What does that sound? Is that me? To an ending point. Oh, I'll just ignore it for a minute. Um, equals uh, the object's change. The object change in kinetic energy between those or uh, between those two points or those same two points. And in equations, it can be summarized as the total work, W total, from A to B equals delta Ke. All right. So we'll end it there. Oh, come on, unfreeze, will you? Oh, frick. <laughs>